December of 1903. It was an amazing time, especially if you happened to live anywhere in North Carolina. Two brothers had tried to do something that nobody else had ever done. They tried to engineer, they tried to design, they tried to build something that had never been achieved before. And time after time, they failed. Time after time, they, they went back to their drafting boards and to their manufacturing plant depressed and rejected. They had been ridiculed by the town's locals for so long, well, they'd become used to it. The entire town laughed at them every time they made another attempt, but their mocking only strengthened the resolve and determination of these two young men even more. And then on one morning, December 17th, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made the first controlled flight of an aircraft. In their excitement, they ran to the post office to send a telegram to their sister, Catherine. The telegram simply said this, flew 120 feet, stop. We'll be home for Christmas, stop. When Catherine got the telegram, she ran down to her local newspaper and showed it to the chief editor. He glanced at it and he said, oh, that's nice. The boys are going to be home for Christmas. You see, he had completely missed the point. Sure, it was going to be nice that the boys would be home for Christmas, but the Wright brothers had flown an airplane for the first time ever. That was the big news. And I wonder, I wonder how often we miss the big news of Christmas. We get caught up in the the tinsel and the lights and the shopping and the gifts and the family. And those things are nice. They're fun. Just like it was nice that the Wright brothers would be home for Christmas. It's nice. But that's not the big news. In our reading this morning, we'll see the big news about Christmas is that God became man. We talked about it Friday night a little bit. We're going to go into it more this morning about why he became man because he wanted to have a relationship with each of us. And so our reading this morning is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, referring to prophet Isaiah in this case. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Today the world will tell you that Christianity is the same as every other world religion. If if you were to take a world religion class at any online university pretty much across the country, the professor will likely tell you 
that there's no difference between the Christian God and almost any other God of almost any other religion. That's what most colleges teach, that by and large, religions are essentially the same. And they're almost right. You see, most religions are essentially the same, with the exception of one. Every religion in the world, whether you're talking about Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism or Islam or Paganism or New Age, nearly every religion in the world requires man to do something in order to work his way up to God. He has to achieve something. He has to perform tasks. He has to earn his way into some type of a relationship with whatever deity is the supreme being. And as a matter of fact, if you study world religions, most religions are not about you having a relationship with God. It's about you becoming a God. That's the one thing that nearly all the world's religions have in common. They require man to do something in an attempt to become divine, to become a God. All of them except one. All of them except biblical Christianity. You see, the goal of Christianity is not and never has been to become a God. The goal of Christianity is to have a relationship with God. God is God. Newsflash for you, we're not. And we never will be. And we never could be. God is far too holy, far too perfect, far too righteous, and far too just for us to ever attain. There is nothing we could ever do or, or hope to do to become God. And since we cannot become God, God had to become man. God had to become man so that in our sin and in our, our imperfection, we could have a relationship with Him. Because in order for God to have a relationship with us, he, His Son stepped down out of His throne from heaven to become a man. If, if you don't remember anything else this morning, I want you to remember this one simple fact. Jesus came to earth as a man because God wanted to have a relationship with you. With you. You. And when we understand that, then we can celebrate Christmas knowing that we have a relationship with God the Father. So I want to take a brief look this morning at the relationship, at that, that the, the strength and the, the, the foundation of that relationship that we have with God. It's, it's actually twofold. The first relationship he desires is, is a human relationship. Now you think about the whole process of childbirth for just a minute. Why would God do that? Why would he expose himself to the drooling and the spitting up and the dirty diapers? Well, there was a French photographer whose name was Christian Mulock, and he needed to get some close-up video footage of a flock of geese, Canadian geese, as they were migrating south. And he struggled to get this video up close. He had to get close to the flock. But every time he got close to them, of course, the flock would fly away. So he developed an ultralight aircraft that he could fly with them. And then he found that the, further, the, the closer he got to the flock as they were flying, they would just turn and go the opposite direction. No matter what he tried, he could never get close enough to, to flying geese to film them. And so finally he came up with an idea. He said, if I could just become a goose, well, then I could get some good footage and I could film them. And so he carefully and meticulously painted his ultralight aircraft to look like a large goose, and he hoped for the best. And it took him some time, but he finally got the geese to accept him as one of their own. And he captured numerous flights from within the flock. And Christian Mulock later wrote this in an autobiography. He said, it was at that moment that I personally understood why Jesus had to come to earth as a man. It was so he could become one of us. 
so he could fly among our flocks and he could experience the same things that we do. You see, in his humanity, Jesus had to endure everything that we have to endure. Anybody here ever had any physical struggles? So did Jesus. Anybody here ever have any hunger or pain or poverty? So did Jesus. Anybody here ever been betrayed by somebody you thought was a friend? So did Jesus. Anybody here ever been mocked or made fun of? So was Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but yet was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus came to earth as a man in order to relate to us. In our sin, in our weakness, there's no way we could ever be good enough to relate to God. We could never work our way into a relationship. So God reached down into history and took on flesh and became a man so he could relate to us. He became a man in order to have a human relationship with us. He became a man in order to save us. But not only did God desire a human relationship, he also desired a holy relationship with us. God is holy. God is high and lifted up. He is righteous. He's powerful. He's ever-present and ever-knowing. He is infinite. That's, that's just who He is. He's perfect. The problem with the English language is we don't have the words to really describe adequately how far God is above man. And because God is holy and perfect, He cannot tolerate imperfect things in His presence because if He did, that would take away, that would detract, that would subtract from His holiness and He would be tainted. So how could an infinitely holy God ever have a relationship with weak and sinful and frail people like you and me? The only way He can do that is because it isn't based on what we bring to the table. Not at all. It isn't based on anything we've earned. Our best efforts fall far short of His holiness. But when Jesus saves us, the Bible tells us that all of our imperfections, all of our frailties are cast out as far as the east is from the west. And then when God looks at us, He sees His Son, His righteous Son, His holy Son. So God desires a human relationship and God desires a holy relationship with us. But that leads me to ask the question, how does that all work? God wants a relationship with us so he became man. But if Jesus is only a man, he couldn't be our savior. I can't save you from your sins. No one else can. So if Jesus is only a man, it's going to fall short of salvation. If Jesus was only a man, he could, have, he could have sympathized with our problems, but he couldn't have saved us. But then again, on the other hand, if God had come as God, he could have only come for one thing, and that would be to judge and condemn us. He couldn't have saved us. But God came down as both. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin as a man, fully man. And at the same time, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin as God the Son, fully God. Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. That is the only way that He could save us. And that's the only way he can have a relationship with us without tainting his holiness. What we celebrate at Christmas time is an awesome event. We celebrate the fact that over 2,000 years ago, an infinite God stepped into history. 
He reached down through his infinite power, his majesty, his might, his glory, and cried the first helpless cry of a newborn baby and was wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. Fully God, fully man. John chapter 1 verse 10 says this about the baby. He was in the world and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into, unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus is no longer the helpless, crying baby in a manger in Bethlehem. He grew up. He lived and taught on this earth for 33 years. Most of the people rejected him. Rejected him to the point of hanging him on a Roman cross. But that was God's plan all along. The baby whose birth we are celebrating was born to die. He was born to die so that you and I could have a relationship with God. But not only was he born to die, he was born to live again. And he lives today and is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Making it possible for us to have a relationship with an ultimately holy God. Do you have that kind of relationship with him today? The relationship that Jesus provides is free. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't deserve it. It is a gift of grace that's given to each of us. He was born to die so that we might live. I want to close this morning by reading you one of my favorite Christmas stories. It's a reminder that Jesus is still alive in the hearts of and the prayers of his people. The story is entitled, Recognizing Jesus. There was once an old shoe cobbler who dreamed one Christmas Eve that Jesus would come to visit him the next day. The dream was so real to him that he was convinced it would come true. So the next morning he got up and went out and, and cut green boughs and decorated his little cobbler shop and got all ready for Jesus to come and visit. He was so sure that Jesus would come that he sat down and waited for him. The hours passed and Jesus didn't come. But then late in the morning there came a soft knocking at the door of his shop. The cobbler opened it, expecting to find Jesus, but instead he saw an old, crippled man. He invited the man to come inside and get warm out of the winter cold. As the cobbler talked with him, he noticed that the man had, ho had holes in his shoes, so he reached up on the shelf and got him a brand new pair. He made sure they fit, and that his socks were dry, and he sent him on his way. And again, he waited. Jesus didn't come. A few hours later, another knock at the door. It must be Jesus, the man thought, and he ran to the door, but again he was disappointed. It wasn't Jesus, only an old woman who had been passing by. She hadn't had a decent meal in days. The two of them sat and visited for a while, and the cobbler prepared her some food for her to eat. He gave her a wonderful meal and sent her on her way. The old man sat down again to wait for Jesus. But Jesus still didn't come. It was getting late when he heard a little boy crying out in front of his shop. He went out and talked with the little boy and discovered that the young man had been separated from his parents and didn't know how to get home. So the cobbler put on his coat, took the boy by the hand, and led him home. When he came back to his little shop, it was dark, the streets were empty and quiet. Later that night, the cobbler gave thanks for his evening meal. He lifted his voice to heaven and said, Oh, Lord Jesus, why didn't you come? 
Then in a moment of silence, he seemed to hear a voice saying, Oh, cobbler, lift up your heart. I kept my word. Three times I knocked at your door today. For you see, I was the man with the bruised feet. I was the woman you gave to eat. I was the little lost boy you helped find his way home. Jesus had come. The cobbler just didn't see it. What I love most about that story is it's a great reminder that Jesus is alive and well and living in the hearts and the smiles and in the love of each one of us. We may not always see God. We may not always feel God's presence. At times, we may feel like we're all alone. But the Bible could not be more clear when it says in Joshua 1.5, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And just a few verses later, one of my favorite verses, I have it hanging on my house right by the door so I can see it as I go out each morning. Joshua 1.9. It says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. My friends, as we leave here today, we can go confidently and boldly, knowing that God will be with us every step, every minute, every moment. Because He came to us as a baby. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much. That you sent your only son. That through his life here on earth, we, we can have an eternal relationship with you. And Father, this morning as we celebrate the birth of a child, the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, help us to remember that it's, it's so much more than just a nice story. It's a life-changing story, and it is the greatest gift that has ever been given. Father, help us in the power of your Holy Spirit to understand the reason Jesus came, the reason came to live among us, to love us, to, to ultimately to die for us, so that we might live forever with you in eternity. And Father, always help us remember what a precious gift we have received. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being here this morning. Please come back next Sunday and don't come alone. Find somebody to bring back to church with you. God bless you.